one of those other many things that we questioned along the way, like what, what are they thinking? Why are they doing this? But uh, and this woman playing this part here of uh, the midwife, she was in Audrey Rose from the film Audrey Rose in the 70s. And I think they thought that was a bit of stunt casting. I didn't quite get it. Um, but uh, it was a great sort of opening of just having a chase at the beginning and, and putting Michael out there and, and getting him on the loose again. Yeah, some questions about the the music for this. Uh, obviously, I scored to this version of the movie because this was going to be the movie. And uh, so that portion that has been eliminated will now be available uh, on a special edition CD that I'll have on my own label, as well as uh, a companion piece with the extended version of Halloween 6. So I'm working on that now. Can't wait. And we get asked that all the time, I mean, because it was such a cool score you came up with for this movie, and I felt like it had strains of some of your early collaborations with John Carpenter and some of the synthesizers, I think, that you guys used back in the day, the Prophets and things like that. And I think we even, I remember talking to you early on when we were scoring this, and I think Joe Chappelle, the director, had said he wanted, like, little refrains to the sounds of things like Escape from New York and Christine and some of those early things that you did with John, which I think you definitely brought some of that to this. And also kind of a Gregorian kind of gothic vibe to some of it because of the occult aspects of the movie. I thought that was kind of a cool new feature to the score. Yeah, the, the, the occult f element with the ruins mm -hmm. uh, definitely gave me a chance to use uh, you know deep, dark voices. Yep. I also, I also yep. pulled out the electric guitar. Yes, and, I remember. And uh, rather than doing it, it was only since I uh, stepped up to the plate to add the Halloween theme on electric guitar and put a lot more percussion. Uh, so that's why I kind of added a rock and roll flavor to it, trying, yep. to, trying to you know continue to to have these things evolve and uh, you know didn't want to just be stuck in the same box. Absolutely. And here this kill actually I thought was kind of cool and re reminiscent the way he kind of stands back and tilts his head. The problem was with the way I'd written it in the script, I'd envision him coming out and kind of that mask just slowly materializing in the darkness like he did in the first one and the second one which are just such great, creepy, building, moody moments of those films. And unfortunately, what we got was just kind of the face appearing, and then five seconds later, she's hanging on the wall. It's a great, creepy kill, but it just happens too fast. And this chase was originally designed of her, it was written that she'd be running through the woods and, and branches scraping at her face, and she runs out and she's supposed to flag down this guy in a truck who's just passing on the road. but because of budget or weather or whatever was going on, they just kind of had her run through train tracks and drop this kid. And <laughs> uh, and then the guy just happens to be sitting there, which I always was kind of like, he's having a beer in the rain. I didn't quite get, but but it would have been really cool if he had, she had just sort of appeared out in, the, in the middle of the road, you know, waving her hands with this baby in her arms. I just thought that was like a creepy, great opening image, or at least for the first, well, I should say second kill in a row here. And this was one of the effects that they later went back and enhanced and they added a kind of a, you know, more of a, a, a you know, he twisted his whole head off, as I recall, in the finished version, the theatrical version that was released. People have asked how she knew how to drive a car. I'm like, I guess if you were being chased by Michael Myers with a baby in your arms and bodies piling up around you, you'd figure it out. This shot is another one of those moments in the production of the film that really kind of got me because this was written as kind of a homage to the original where the POV walks up to the house. It was supposed to enter the house, go in the back door, pick up a knife, go up the stairs, stab the girl, Kara, and she, he, this little kid wakes up from the nightmare. And on the day that we were shooting it, the UPM just shut it down. He just I don't know if they were going into overtime or what happened, but, you know, we just we lost this great kind of, I felt, iconic moment to start the movie off. But this is like a continuation of the Strode family. This is kind of, I guess they would be the closest we could say would be cousins of the people that adopted Lori Strode. So this is Kara, the cousin, and her young boy, Danny. Danny's definitely a nod to the boy in The Shining. Not myself, but Danny Lloyd from The Shining. Because he had psychic powers. Kind of like this kid we're sort of intimating had some sort of psychic ability. Marianne Hagen came in, she auditioned, I, I want to say early in the process, but she really had that kind of every girl quality and she looked a little, 
you know,